Good morning. So we are covering, this is week eight. Yay. Uh, we're going to continue on in chapter 10 today. So let's take a look at Blackboard and what we're looking at. Mm, here we go. Okay. So in week eight, we're covering sections 10.2 and 10.3. A um, couple things about this week. When we're working with data sets, we have no problems. We have no issues with um, our guru. But um, unfortunately, there are a couple issues with my stat lab and with summary statistics. So from what I can tell, our guru does not handle summary statistics for the F test, which is 10.3. And it also, when it does handle um, the F test using a data set, our guru doesn't give us the F critical value. Um, and for day-to-day -day analysis, that's not important. It gives us the P value. We can make a decision. But you know my stat lab is difficult, and there are some problems in my stat lab that require a test statistic, the F test statistic to be, I'm not test statistics, sorry, the F critical values to be identified. So um, you are going to have to explore multiple ways of doing these problems simply because the technology unfortunately fails us this week and does not allow us to do everything we need for our my stat lab homework. So there's a couple of things in here. I have videos that will be helpful, especially for summary statistics. Um, again, that's when you don't have a whole data set and calculating these tests. So that video is just on the independence. We don't have to worry about 10.2. Our guru does everything for that. It's 10.3, that's a problem. So here's the calculator way to do it. And I've also posted a video um, I believe is for Excel. I can't remember now. Um, Excel does show you the F critical value in Excel. I'm pretty sure that this is the video for Excel. So that's going to be really helpful to do it in Excel. Um, you have a case study this week. Um, you can find that here. And this is a web page that I found. I haven't played with it enough to know if it's 100% accurate, but it allows us to put in summary statistics and gives us the F critical value, which is what we're missing from our guru. So um, hopefully, you know, maybe we'll play with this website um, with the example we're doing today to see. No, I don't have summary statistics for it. Hmm. I'll show you this though, so that um, you guys know what it is when we get there. Okay, so. I'll pull this back in after. Okay, and here's the PowerPoint that I'll be lecturing from. So let me switch gears and head over to my PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, so we are first going to do 10.2, which is talking about using the chi-squared statistic um, and the test with chi-square to determine whether two qualitative variables are independent. Okay, so we are going to be testing qualitative variables today, and we want to know whether they're dependent, two variables are dependent on each other, or whether they are independent, meaning not related. So a contingency table is what we're going to start using, and you're going to see the difference when we're in our guru. I'm not going to be creating or importing data frames anymore. So data frames are for uh, one-way variables, and we're starting to take a look at two-way tables. Oh, sorry, it's early. Uh, <laughs> uh, two-way tables is when we have variables where the count or the frequency is dependent on the two variables, or it is made up of the two variables, which you'll see when I take a look at these tables and why we are working with different things and how we have to enter it differently into our guru. So the assumptions for the chi-square test for independence or association, because um, essentially we're testing for their relationship, um, the first is that the conditions for the multinomial random variable are met for both variables. 
You remember that that is an amped up binomial distribution. So we are concerned about the probability of success needs to remain the same from trial to trial. Remember there, there are only two outcomes for a binomial distribution. A multinomial distribution, there can be several outcomes. So we don't, we aren't restricted to one success and failure. Still has to be defined as success failure, but it could be multiple successes and a failure. The expected value of each one of the categories we're working with should be at least five. Okay, so our, when we set up our hypotheses in general for this test, the null hypothesis is always going to represent the two qualitative variables are independent, not related. Holy crap, so sorry, I can't stop yawning this morning. Um, and the alternative hypothesis is that the two qualitative variables are dependent, meaning that they are related. So let's take a look at our first example. So consider a particular question from Quinnipiac University poll. The Quinnipiac University poll is often used as a barometer of public opinion regarding public, uh, matters of public concern. So let's consider the question would you support or oppose raising the national minimum wage? For those who responded to the question, the results are in this following table. So notice that the table is two-way table, meaning there are variables here, Republican, Democrat, Independent, and there are responses or variables here, yes or no. And to read these frequencies, you need to read left and up in order to understand what that number represents. This number represents that there are 208 Republicans that answered yes to the question of raising minimum wage. Okay, we're going to need that table. Now I could copy and paste this table into Excel, make it an Excel file, then import it into our guru. That's fine. But remember, it only recognizes one header for um, labels, so you would have to delete this title row, and you actually can't have these totals in here either. Um, it does not work. It recognizes, oops, it recognizes um, those totals as a new variable and it throws off the count or the degrees of freedom really, just throws off everything else. So first we have to determine the null and the alternative hypothesis. For this example, we are interested in the proportion of the respondents who fall into each of the support for national minimum wage and political affiliation categories. The chi-squared test for association between the two variables is always a one-sided test because of the way we construct the test statistic. Oh, excuse me. We will reject the null hypothesis for large values of the test statistic. So here we are, we have our null hypothesis that states to support for raising the national minimum wage and the political affiliation are independent, meaning that your public, your political affiliation has no relationship with your response to that question. While the alternative hypothesis says the opposite, that raising the national minimum wage in support of that and your political affiliation are related, or we're saying that there is a dependent relationship between the two. We'll be using an alpha level of 0.1. Right, let's check our assumptions. Each respondent was not allowed to respond to more than one category, so we are good. That meets the multinomial random variable. And the expected count for each category is greater than five. It's hard for us to determine that. Um, well, actually, I guess not because we have the data right here and they're definitely all greater than five. So. so let's now head over to our guru. Let's put this in. So this is a good one for me to show you um, practice on putting in a contingency table into our guru find where it is. Where's my... Not finding... Let me stop sharing. I'll try it this way. Here we go. Okay. I don't know if that was showing before. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go to data. I'm 
going to go into import, but this time I'm going to create a table, not a data frame, a table. You can see there's labels for the rows, there's labels for the columns. So here we're going to type Republican. Down arrow. Oh, that didn't work. Sorry, up here we can add another row. So we need three rows. We're going to have Republican, Democrat, and Independent. Those are three parties. And then the first variable we can name up here, we'll name it as the response of yes. Use our add a column button and label this one the response of no. Double click in these boxes to enter values and then you can use your down arrow to go to the next one. Double click. Down arrow, down arrow. We need to add labels so that we can easily select these things for analysis. So our row level, our row label would be political affiliations. Our column labels would be our responses. And your variable name is always going to be frequency because that's what are you using in order to determine what is the factor here? Um, the statistic. We need to save our table so we can refer to it when we're doing analysis. So we'll save this as um, example. Let's do min wage 10.2. Let's save it like that. So I'm going to hit save as. Now remember, every time we create a new table or data frame, it's always a good rule of thumb to come into your list, double click, and take a look that it actually imported correctly. This morning I was doing this and it wasn't showing anything when I double clicked it. So the analysis was wrong. It was coming off all weird and I didn't know why. And then I realized that this wasn't importing right. So notice how it reorganizes your, your variables. It's a Republican matched with yes and frequency. Republican matched with no frequency. And that's how our Google reorganizes. Sometimes I find that looking at the way our Google reorganizes the table helps me understand what our Google needs or how it works or how it analyzes the information by taking a look at how it organizes it. All right, I am going to shrink my data menu and come down to analytics and go to analysis. This is called a contingency table because it is two way. So when we select contingency table, we see that we are doing an analysis of two way contingency tables, which means we have two variables and a count, a single count for two variables. So we have to identify the data set, select the one we just created, minimum wage 10.2. We have to indicate the two factors. So we have political affiliations and we have responses. We are doing a chi oh wait, hold on. Frequency is going to be our frequency. We're doing a chi squared test. These three tests are uh, more tests of independence that we aren't currently covering right now. Okay, we have other tests here that we don't need to play with quite yet. Let's type in our alpha level, which I believe was 0.1. Yes. Let's hit our little eyeball. So here I can see the observed counts um, and it reordered them in, in alphabetical order, so that's okay. Notice that it does the totals for me, which is why I couldn't have them included because then it, it recognized total as a variable and my degrees of freedom were incorrect. So the degrees of freedom for a chi-squared test accounts for both variables. So it's this subset, three minus one, which gives us two, and two minus one, which gives us one, and then you multiply them, so we get two times one, which gives us a degree of freedom of one. So that's the formula for calculating degrees of freedom, which our software does for us. Notice our p-value is really damn small, so small that it, they're saying it's close to zero, which means this is very significant, and we'd be rejecting our null hypothesis. 
Here we have the chi-squared observation test statistic. So here's our map of the p-value. Notice it's zero, so you barely see any area. And as we were talking about this very one-sided distribution, here's our critical value. So here we can see the critical value of 4.6. Our chi-squared is huge, way bigger than that, also indicating rejecting the null hypothesis. And at the bottom here, we can see the expected counts. Okay, these are the expected values of these. Um, and if we continue down in the PowerPoint, that is something that's also given when calculating a chi-squared test. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. So there is evidence at the point one level to conclude that support for raising the national minimum wage and political affiliation are dependent. The difference in support is too great to believe it is contributed to ordinary sampling variation alone. So they're saying essentially that the correlation between if you're Republican and whether you support the raising the minimum wage is, is um, a dependent relationship that your, your political affiliation is directly affecting your response in the question. And that would mean that the difference between the responses is not by chance. Okay, so that's 10.2. 10.3 is a one-way ANOVA test. ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. Okay, Analysis of Variance. And as promised, if you took STAT 1 with me, said we would focus a lot more on variance in STAT 2. And we're going to see that. Okay, so the formula... I thought I deleted this. What the? Hmm. I swear I deleted these slides and they're not deleted. Weird. Okay. <laughs> well, here's the formulas that I thought I deleted, but um, you can see that they're quite unpleasant and no one's going to want to calculate these out by hand. And it's actually even stated in this particular text, this chapter, that they do not recommend you um, doing any of this out by hand. Now notice that I'm using a Hawks PowerPoint, which is typical for me. I wanted to give you guys extra examples, but again, this week I really didn't have a choice. I had to use this because if you look at the Pearson examples, Pearson PowerPoint, they give you the example and then they tell you by technology, we found this as the answer but they don't walk you through how to put it in the technology at all, so they're not very helpful. Um, although, okay, I can't say they're not that helpful because once you learn it today, then you'll be able to enter in those values and make sure you're getting the right answer, especially if you have to use that website because if test statistics are given, then, um, or not test statistics, sorry, if sample um, summary statistics are given versus a data set, then unfortunately our guru is not helpful for us. As you might expect, these measures of variability are the fundamental pieces which will be used to develop a hypothesis test for determining whether or not there is a significant difference among population means. This is precisely the reason that the test which we will use to make this decision is often called the analysis of variance, or ANOVA. The expressions are complicated Unfortunately, most statistical analysis programs will compute these quantities. So the assumptions that we need to test for, first one is that the sample observations are randomly selected and the samples are independent of each other. So we've covered a couple, covered all of this stuff before. We want to make sure that everything is randomly selected, which is important from day one, and that the samples are independent of one another. So remember, that was the difference between doing a shoe experiment where, um, where if you put shoes, uh, Pumas on group A and you put Nikes on group B, then those are dependent sets. Group A has nothing to do with group B. 
But if you wanted a better, so in some cases, a paired, um, paired experiment is better, and that would mean that you would put the Pumas on the left foot and the Nikes on the right foot, um, each person, and those would be dependent sets. Okay, the distributions of all K populations of interest are approximately normal. The variances of K populations are equal. Um, so these assumptions, some of them uh, we take for granted, and not necessarily for granted, but uh, our book gives us preformed problems where they kind of tell us all of this stuff. But remember, in our guru, if we're working with a data set, it gives us the test for normality in there. And to determine whether the variances are equal, there's also a test for that as well. But there is an easy way to determine this. So there is a simple rule of thumb that you can use to check the variance assumption. If the largest standard deviation, which recall standard deviation is the square root of variance, is no more than twice the smallest standard deviation, then the presumption is that the assumption holds. So that would mean that the variances are not equal because we're showing a great enough difference. It's a great way to test if you're doing this by hand or you can't find it in our guru. So we're going to be using something called an F-test. Um, don't worry about these variables. We don't do this out by hand. Please don't do this out by hand. Um, please watch the videos that I have posted in Blackboard, especially when you have to do this with summary statistics, because your calculator is great. It handles summary statistics, and so does that website that I posted. Okay, um, we will reject the null hypothesis that the, hy the, that the population means are equal for large values of f. And this is why the f test difference, uh, this is why the test for differences among population means is often referred to as the f test. All right, so our procedure is that we are going to take the observations from each sample and they're randomly selected and the samples are independent of one of another. Our K populations are normally distributed and our variances are approximately equal. Our hypothesis is that the means from each one of our selected populations are approximately equal and the null, I mean the alternative would be that at least one of them is different. Now one thing that the ANOVA test does not do is if we find that the there is at least one mean that is different from the others. The only thing it doesn't tell us is which one. So we might be working with uh, 25 different populations, which gives us 25 different mu's. And we might find that for our rejecting the null hypothesis, and we don't know why. <laughs> like we'll be rejecting the null hypothesis because well, we know that one of the 25 are not equal to the others. But we won't actually be able to um, identify which one of the 25. So there could be 24 that are approximately equal and you have one that's not and you won't know which one. So that's a downfall of the test. Um, here is the formula. And I hope you can see by this formula of how to calculate the F test statistic that you don't want to do this out by hand. Like I'm a math person and I look at this and it hurts my feelings. So Please watch all of the technology videos because you will need more than just our guru. Remember, our guru will only handle data sets. Okay, example. You have just been promoted to sales manager of a company manufacturing robots used to assemble automobiles. Cool. Although your sales force is given a suggested price at which to sell the robots, they have considerable leeway in negotiating the final price. Past sales records indicate that sometimes there is a large difference in sales prices, which different sales reps are able to negotiate. You are interested in knowing if the difference is significant, possibly because of more effective negotiating strategy or exceptional interpersonal skills, or whether this observed difference in sales price is just due to random variation. You decide to randomly select four sales over the last year for each of your three sales representatives and observe the actual selling price of the robot. The table on the next slide shows these amounts 
at which the robot was sold in thousands of dollars. Okay, so we are looking at our table and we can see that we have four sales listed for each one of the salespersons. And we have average and standard deviations given. Oh, good, because we're gonna use this to try to use that website. So I am gonna write those down real quick. So salesperson one, two, and three. We have 12.25, 14, 12.75, standard deviation, 1.708, 2.160, and 1.708. Okay, our alpha level is 0 0.05. So step one, determining the null and the alternative. The null is gonna represent there's no difference in the average sale price among the three reps. The alternative is going to represent that there is a difference in average price among the three reps. First, mu1 will be for sales rep1, mu2, blah, blah, blah. Based on the way the test statistic is constructed, we will reject the null hypothesis for large values of the test statistic, which remember we're using F, meaning that the variability among the sample mean is much larger than the variability within the sample observations. Thus, the F test is always a one-sided test. Okay, so the null hypothesis, our mu's are all equal. The alternative is that at least one is different, but remember we won't know which one if we do end up rejecting the null. We're going at a 0 0.05 significance level. We need to validate the assumptions. Were the sample sales prices for each of the sales reps collected independent and random? Okay, so independent means not all on the same day. Remember we had an example where it was a dependent set, sales of three, I wanna say they were breweries or something, some bars, it was three bars, I believe. Uh, and they picked the sales on the same, the four sales were picked on the same days for all three locations. That was dependent. So here we are assuming that there was four random sales chosen for each salesperson, but not linked together on the same day. Are the sales prices for each of the sales reps normally distributed? And do the sales prices for each of the sales reps have essentially the same variance? Okay, so independent random samples for each salesperson, we can conclude yes, because we were told that, I believe, in the problem. Um, when it comes to the distribution being approximately normal, did it mention that anywhere? Let's see. Um, I don't see it mentioning anywhere, which means that they're making these assumptions about testing for, or they tested for it behind the scenes. Kind of annoying. All right, um, and then the variances, they explain it here. The standard deviations, if you square them all, because remember, if you go from standard deviation to variance, they are, they look approximately equal. But we can test that because we just learned up here that we just have to take the largest standard deviation and make sure it's no more than twice the smallest. So if we take a look at the largest one, which is 2.16, we need to make sure that it is not more than twice 1.708. So if I go to my calculator real quick, see if I can share my calculator. Mm. You guys can't see it. Okay, here's my calculator. So I'm going to do 1.708 times 2, and I get 3.416. And I see that, okay, so 2.160 is not uh, more than twice the lowest, which means that we do indeed have approximately equal variances. Okay, that makes me feel better. That's how we got that. 
Okay, let's now head over to our guru. We're going to use this one to practice setting up a table again. So let's go, let's close these out because we're moving on to a different example. Data, import, create new table. Could we have, I'm, I, you know, I don't know if I have to label those. Um, first variable is salesperson one. And there are four values. First value is 10, 14, and these are in thousands of dollars, remember. Sales person two and sales person three. We have 11, 16, 14, 15, sales person three. We have 11, 13, 12, 15. Okay, so my row label is sales and money, sales in thousands. My column is the sales persons. Variable name is always frequency. We're gonna save this as sales persons, and we'll do 10.3, save as. They're telling us we do need labels here. So sales one, sales two, sales three, and I'm double clicking to get into these gray boxes, sales four. Okay, now we can save. Again, I'm gonna double check that everything typed in right, double clicking this will do that for me. Okay, so we have the first sales for the first salesperson turns out to be 10. Um, first sale for the second person is 11 and so on. Now let's go to analysis, uh, analytics, and then analysis. And we are going to be doing an ANOVA this time. Notice we can do a one-way or a two-way. Two ways next week. So one way is what we're working with. Select our data set, salesperson 10.3. Our response variable is frequency. Our factor, which is what we are trying to compare, and we're trying to compare the salesperson. Um, and we are using a 0 0.05 alpha level. These two boxes are grayed out until you select them. So here, if I select diagnostics, um, I can select a bunch of these different tests. We'll leave them at the default for now and post hoc test. So these tests are, they have to do with testing the um, quality of variants. We don't necessarily cover them in detail here. Let's uh, our eyeball. Okay, so we have a count of four sales for each salesperson. The null hypothesis is saying that the sales are equal on all levels for the salesperson. We have the F test statistic, 0.92857. We have the P value. Okay, we have the P value here, 0.42. That is a huge P value. So we do not have a significance outcome and we will not be rejecting the null hypothesis. We have our degrees of freedom. And we have our residual. I love that our guru does this really cool plot where we have the three sales people and we can take a look. Remember box plots, this is the median line, median line, middle values. You can see sales one and sales two, their middle values are the same, but it looks like sales three, although their median is here, they have a skewed right distribution because they have much higher outlier um, sales up here. Like salesperson two is drastically different when it comes to its median. 
but it is skewed left. Look at this huge box down here. So it seems like the majority of its cells are actually here. They're just spread out and lower, which is probably why our average sales for all three salespersons did not come out to be significantly different. Here are the residual plots. Okay, here is the one of the tests I was showing you that was the right click box in basics. So that was here. The post hoc test. It tested whether our variances are approximately equal and it does determine that yes, it, they are approximately equal. We did that by, um, by checking the largest standard deviation, that being twice the smallest standard deviation. Here's other tests that we don't necessarily cover that, that in depth. Okay. Um, all right, so that is this week. Again, you will need to do stuff. Oh, I wanted to show you the same example, but in that website. Hold on. Let's go back to that website. Mm. Why isn't in there, though? Hold on. I need to find it. Okay. Try this again. Here we go. So if we go in this website, it says if we put in the counts, or um, so our counts are four for each of these. There are four sales for each one of the salespersons. So this is salesperson one, two, and three. And the mean for the first one was 12.25. The mean for the second sales, and these are in thousands, remember, 14 and 12.75. Standard deviation, 1.708, 2.5. If we click compute, then we can see the degrees of freedom, two and nine, okay? We have our variances, which are approximately equal, and we have our p-value and our f-test statistic. I don't think it gives you the f-critical value either. confidence levels which are cool okay so if you're just given the summary statistics the mean and the standard deviations then this is a way for you to run the test so we still have our p-value um, and we have our f test statistic but we don't have the critical value so i'm not really sure how they expect us to um, do that um, excel does give you the f critical so please watch that video that's in blackboard um, to help you guys get the F critical value. Uh, there's there's also most likely a table in my stat lab for F critical values, and that might be the easiest way to go. And my stat lab will walk you through that because you know my stat labs help me solve this button, loves to do things out by hand. So you may want to entertain that as well. So you will have to do some extra watching videos and reading uh, simply because my stat labs asking questions that our guru doesn't have responses for. Um, but the, all the resources are in either my stat lab under tools for success or they're in your blackboard already from me. Okay, so that concludes our lesson this week. I hope you guys are having a good first week fully online. If you need anything or if you have any questions, you know where to find me.